welcome to the Word of Truth, the Sunday school class of the air with your teacher, Rod Payne. The Word of Truth. Hi, and thanks for joining us again here on The Word of Truth. I'm so glad that you've chosen to spend this next roughly half hour with us as we study God's Word. And today we're talking about God's value of human life. And God does value all human life extremely. You may be thinking today, I'm worthless. You may be thinking, or maybe you've been thinking for quite some time, that you really don't have any intrinsic value. Well, that's not true. Now, over time, you'll hear different uh, scientists and folks report about how much the value of just the chemical composition of our bodies. That's not where in your value lies. Your value lies in the fact that God loves you so much, as it says in John 3.16, that he sent his only son to die on your, on my behalf, on our behalf, that we would know eternal life, that we would know a relationship, that we would have a relationship with him. You're worth a great deal more, many of you, than you believe you are. Today, we're going to be talking about how much God does value human life. But before we get into that, if you've had a birthday around this third Sunday in the month of January, I want to say a very happy birthday to you. If your birthday's anywhere around the 16th of January, happy birthday to you. If you have an anniversary that you celebrate around this time, happy anniversary. If on the other hand, as I say almost every week, you're commemorating the passing of a loved one during this time, you're remembering some event in your life that brings you pain and sorrow, I pray that God would give you his peace that passes all understanding. And I pray that God would restore to your heart joy. And if you've not had joy, I pray that God will give you joy during this time. If you'd like for us to pray with you about something that's going on in your life or in the life of someone for whom you care, we'd be honored to be able to do that. You can write to us at the same address we've had forever, the Word of Truth. 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and our zip code is 76301. That address again is the Word of Truth. 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and our zip code is 76301. Write to us and let us know that you're praying for us. But if you'd like, please give us the honor of being able to pray with you about yourself, a situation that's going on in your life, or perhaps someone for whom you care. We'd be honored to join you in prayer. Well, as I mentioned, we're talking today about how much God values life. We're going to be in several chapters in Ezekiel. We're going to be in chapter 16, in chapter 23 of Ezekiel, as well as we're going to jump back in our Bibles to Psalms, the 139th chapter. So let me give you those chapters again. If you'd like, you may turn to them. We're only going to be picking a few verses out of each one, or the folks who have written the curriculum that we study have only picked a few verses out of each one of those chapters. But again, that's chapter 16, chapter 23, and chapter 139. Chapter 16 and 23 in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 139 in the book of Psalm. As we look at how much God values human life, because this day is on many calendars, a sanctity of human life or that kind of thing, day, in not only the U.S., but in other parts of the globe as well. We need to remember that God does value our lives. Again, why would he have sent his son Jesus to die on our behalf if he didn't? Why would he have constantly be giving us in his word and through our interaction with him in prayer, encouragement, course correction, principles and precepts by which we can live, not just live, by which we can thrive. We talked last week about those who are just existing, like walking around zombie-esque. And then the difference between those folks and those people who've had the breath of life of Christ, of God breathed into them, restoring, renewing, revitalizing their very lives. I pray that for everyone watching this program today. Well, today, some of you need to hear that God loves you so much and values you very greatly. We seem to live and have lived for decades now in this globe or on this globe, in this culture, in a life that, or in a, in a world rather, that doesn't place a high value on human life anymore. 
the rise and the prevalence of such things as human trafficking, specifically sexual trafficking of children even, people as young as children, sometimes infants, that are sold into this form of despicable, they call it a trade, they call it a human trafficking trade. It's, it's despicable. There's no other word for it. It's vile. But not only that, but the abortion that has been made legal in our nation, and they say, what's well, to protect life. It's not. The vast majority still statistically of abortions that are performed are not to preserve the life of the mom carrying that child in the womb, but rather seemingly for no other reason than the convenience of someone saying, I don't right now or perhaps ever want to carry a child to full term to give birth. I don't want to be responsible. And so I'm going to elect to have a procedure which many, many hundreds of thousands of testimonies down through the ages, especially since Roe v. Wade, have given testimony to the fact that it's debilitating to the woman. And if you've had an abortion, you need to know that God forgives. God can restore and God can heal. There are many women today carrying the silent shame of that act and they say, oh, there's no hope for me because I've taken another human life. No, that's not true. Paul was adamant in his, in his persecution and in his seeming, seeing the destruction of believers. But Paul was forgiven by Jesus whom he said, why are you persecuting me? Paul was forgiven. Saul, who became Paul, was forgiven by God and was used as an instrument of God, second only to Jesus himself in the New Testament. God can't forgive you. But we live in a world today that seemingly discards human life. The games are the most popular games that young people often play, and I'm talking young people, are games where they dispatch, they kill their opponent, and they do it, and the body count just rises and rises and rises. We have devalued human life to the point where we've become hardened in our hearts, even within the body of Christ, to the point where we don't rise up and say, what can we do as individuals and collectively to try to stem the tide of abortion? You see, it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to actually get involved. And some folks will say, but I don't know what to do. You can find ways to help. You can find ways to help stem the tide of abortion. I love our ministry that we have here at the church called Orphans Embrace because part of what they do is to help facilitate, even financially when they're able, to help facilitate adoption for families because adoption is a loving alternative. It's a life-saving, it's a life-giving alternative to abortion. Years ago, when my wife was first volunteering for a, a, uh, a pro-life organization, then later in the back room of one of our, uh, our little rental house said, I'm praying and I just believe that God is telling me to start an adoption agency. I was saying, what? I have no idea where to even begin. But Vicki said, well, I'm just going to keep asking questions and keep calling people. This was a long time, I think, before the Internet, at least before we had it. But she said, I'm going to keep asking and calling people, and I'm going to find out a way... And from that, and from God giving her that, that, um, that urgency in her heart came inheritance adoptions, which is still going strong today in the year 2022. Still seeing lives touched and changed and families coming together through adoption. One lady, one lady praying to God and believing God for something to occur. First time I ever saw a mobile phone, my wife was carrying it, and it was in a, something not much smaller than a briefcase, maybe, maybe bigger than a lunchbox, but not much smaller than a briefcase, about the size of an ammunition, an old ammo box or some kind, but it had a portable phone in it. And none of us had the phone number because it was strictly to be used by inheritance adoptions for phone calls related to adoption. People would show up at our house sometimes with children, or we would get a call, you know, get some preemie diapers or some infamil soy formula, and you're about to have a child come. Or sometimes pregnant ladies came and lived at the house. We weren't rich. We weren't, uh, I think, I know Vicky's a lot smarter than I am, but we, you know, we weren't, uh, doc we didn't have doctoral degrees or anything like that. 
fact, at that time, Vicki had not even finished, I don't know, she had not even finished her master's degree at that point. And mine was in uh, communications and minor in theology. Mine wasn't anything to do with human services. But God laid it on our hearts. So you're saying, well, I'm not starting an adoption. Aid. That's okay. You can open up your home. You can pray. You can give whatever God lays on your heart financially to give. You can help things like the center, our own, our wonderful center that we have here, our inheritance adoptions or others like Orphans Embrace Ministry that help people help to save lives. God values human life. Look at chapter 16 in the book of Ezekiel. We're going to look at verses 20 and 21. Ezekiel is hearing from God and God says to him, he's telling him to speak to the children of Israel. And I want you to hear these words and I want you to transfer it now. I want you to bring it down through the ages to the year 2022 and not only the United States, but worldwide. He says it like this. You took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me. In other words, I blessed you with offspring. You took them and you sacrificed them as food to idols. Now, what's an idol? It's anything that we allow to take the place of God in our lives with our attention, with our affirmation, with our affection. We'll go on down the list. An idol is something that we allow to take the place of God in our lives. So let's transfer this, let's translate this rather down to the day. We're saying that children are disposable and we're saying it as a nation. We're saying it as a world. And we're asking why do these, and I'm again, not a prophet, but why do these calamitous, why do these uh, bad things occur? Is it possible that God is saying, you've done this too, world in the year 2022, you've done this. Wasn't your prostitution not enough? He doesn't ask that um, to hear an answer. He's asking that rhetorically. In other words, it wasn't bad enough, world, that you legalized prostitution in, in sometimes whole nations, but certainly even in the United States in certain cities. That if you go to Amsterdam, for instance, in the Netherlands, and you find that prostitution is legal, or they'll say it's illegal, but they just look the other way. He says, wasn't your prostitution enough? Verse 21, you slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to idols. Again, if you look at the statistics, you will find that the vast majority of the abortions that take place are not to save the life of the mother. They are primarily, and don't, don't listen to the, to, the, to the statistics that they'll give you from some place like Planned Parenthood. No. Listen to the real statistics that come from people who really, for all intents and purposes, don't have, as we would say colloquially, a dog in the fight. They're just saying this is what we learn. The vast majority are not to save the life of the mom. There because someone has decided, I don't want to bring a child to full term. I don't want to be a parent. And so I'm going to take care of this. And again, you need to hear me if, if, if you've had an abortion. God is not condemning you to a life where you'll never have a relationship with him, where you'll never know any peace in your life, where your heart can never be rekindled and renewed and restored. That's not the case. If he could restore us Saul and make him Paul, if he could bring Peter to be the rock on which he was going to build his church after he denied Christ three times, he can restore us too, regardless. That's not the unpardonable sin. He says it like this, In all your detestable practices and your prostitution, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, kicking about in your own blood. In other words, and I've often seen this uh, said, those who are pro-abortion are not the child in the womb. And when they say that it's their life, they should make the decision, my body, my life, my decision, what about that child? Who gives that child the opportunity to decide if they want to be alive or prematurely dead? God, speaking through Ezekiel, says right here, you forgot yourself. When you were a child, now some folks will say, I had a lousy childhood. I had awful parents. And, and why would I bring another child into this awful world? Not every life has to end up like the one that you've experienced. Not every life has to. 
you need to hear me today. Someone needs to hear this today. God values you and you've not done so much that he detests or has thrown you aside and says, worthless, there's no hope, there's no future. We talked about this last week in Ezekiel 37. Let me reiterate it again today. Someone needs to hear this today. Wherever it is you're watching, God loves you and he places such a high priority on your life that he sent his son to die in your stead, in my stead. He, he took our place. God through Ezekiel says, I don't understand all the things you lived and why is it that you don't value someone else to have that same opportunity to live as well? Regardless of what's happened to you, you are alive. Jump over to Ezekiel chapter 23. We're going to look at verses 36 through 39. God says the same thing here again, basically. He reiterates, and then he says it like this. The Lord said to me, Son of man, will you not judge? And he says two names here, Ohala and Ohalaba. And by the way, those stand for basically the northern and the southern kingdom of Israel. So if you want to, you can substitute Judah and Israel, or you can substitute the main cities in both locales. Your quarterly correctly points this out. But God is saying, won't you judge both sides? You know, one side saw the collapse of the other and knew that it had to do with the fact that they were not staying in a right relationship with God. Maybe someone watching this program today, you're addicted. Maybe you're addicted to drugs or you're addicted to alcohol or you're addicted to pornography or you're addicted to sex outside of marriage. Whatever it is, you know in your heart of hearts there's an addiction. And you've probably seen someone else who suffered because of their addiction. What is it about human beings? What is it about us as a species that doesn't allow us to learn from, someone's else's, from someone else's mistakes so we don't have to make the same ones? What is it about us as people that doesn't let us learn from someone else's mistake? We've always got the impression as people that, yes, they stumbled, they fell, but I'll, I'll survive, or I'll be able to get through this, or I'll be able to do whatever I, I want to do, and I won't suffer consequence. What is it about us as people that makes us have that kind of thought? I like to read history. I've confessed that on more than one occasion. I do enjoy studying history. And part of the reason that I do is because I want to learn from it. Okay? I don't want to be Napoleon-esque in my carriage, believing myself to be the master of all of my domain and the ruler of all I survey, and then to meet my, if you will, Waterloo. I don't want to believe that all roads eventually lead to Rod, as they believed in the Roman Empire, that all roads led to Rome. I want to learn from those people who've come before me and see that time and time again, a grandiose expectation, a grandiose ego, a larger than life persona that believes its own press time and time again falls. Okay. Time and time again. We look at those pyramids today now and the antiquities that are contained therein. And we say to ourselves, amazing works, amazing feats of human construction and engineering, but who really cares? I mean, it is fascinating to look at the treasures that they found in Tutankhamun's, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, pyramid. But in all sincerity, does he impact my daily life? From Does he have anything to do with inflation? Does he have anything to do with the COVID virus? Does he have anything to do with go down through the... No, he doesn't. But he was laboring under the delusion... That somehow or another, if he was embalmed in the right way and that they had all the right things contained within that same uh, tomb, that somehow or another he would come back to life at some point and he would rule and reign and he would have everything necessary. No, he didn't. And no one who believes their own press is going to. God said all the way down through these ages, you're still doing the same thing. Confront them then, God says to Ezekiel in verse 36, continuing on, with their detestable practices. For they have committed adultery and blood is on their hands. They committed adultery with their idols. They even sacrificed their children whom they bore to me as food to them. God gives life. Now I'll grant you that in sin was I conceived in my mother's womb. That's true. But God is the giver of life. And one of the most powerful 
portrayals of that I have ever seen in my life, and I've said that on this program numerous times, was many, many years ago when I was teaching at a, at a uh, conference in Florida, and they gave us a day off, and they let us go to Disney World, not Disneyland in California, Disney World in Florida. And I went to one exhibit that talked about conception and the gestation and the growth and the, you know, what the embryo looked like in the mother's womb. It was a remarkable presentation. It was at Disney of all places, one of the most left leaning organizations probably on the planet. I know that they represented family entertainment for many, many years. And I don't know about Walt and anti-Semitism and all these other things. I just know that for a long time, you knew if you saw that little fairy flying around and they did their wand, that you were probably going to see a, a G-rated motion picture with Dean Jones or somebody like that. And, and maybe a, a talking doll or something. I don't know. They represent family entertainment. Now, of course, they have gay pride days and all kinds of stuff at, at, at their location. So you know, I'm not saying that they're mean people, but certainly not the same ideals they used to perhaps represent. In any respect, the best, I'd never seen it in any uh, Christian organization, the, the wonderful technology that they used to show how the sperm and the egg came together and how that tiny little, yeah, was a human being. There were eyeballs. And yeah, it, it formed like a little shrimp initially, but you saw the little hands appearing, and then it began to take you through the, the formation and the, and the growth of that until there was a little bitty baby in the mother's womb. Amazing. When David writes in the psalm we're about to read a minute ago, talking about the womb, and he talks about it, he gives it the bowels of the earth as his reference. It's because in all sincerity, he wasn't a scientist. He didn't dissect uh, people and he didn't have, uh, uh, you know, sonograph or chronograph, sonographs, that, that kind of thing, you know, where they could do the, the, you know, put the little instrument on the mom's belly and they could actually see the representation on the screen of the infant. He, he didn't have all that kind of thing. But he knew somewhere in his heart of hearts, he knew that that womb is a sacred and life giving place. But here Ezekiel is talking to the northern and the southern kingdom, and he's basically saying, you even sacrificed your children to idols. What are we doing, world? What have we done, world? We've sacrificed almost an entire generation of young people who've grown up, for instance, in fatherless homes. Because we've not said marriage is sacred. We've gotten things out of order. We've said, well, okay, instead of have a marriage, have a relationship established between human, two human beings that is within the bonds and the sanctity of marriage, and there is a commitment on their part, and then that leads to, yes, them knowing one another in the biblical sense, sex, and then children. We've said, well, you can ha have sex before marriage or any time you, know, you want, and then if a child comes, you keep it or not keep it, just depends on what you want to do. And if after a while you think it works out, get married if you think you think it's going to last. We've gotten it all reversed. They've done this also to me at the same time they defiled my sanctuary. They desecrated my Sabbaths. Because we still, as people say, well, but, you know, I can do whatever I want to Monday through Saturday. But as long as I'm there for an hour on Sunday or maybe two hours, then everything will be okay. And I think God is saying down through the ages, it doesn't work. It's not working. Finally, over at 139 of the book of Psalms, look at verse 13. This is David writing, and he said, I praise you because, you know, first off, 13, you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, verse 14, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. We would not be th talking about abortion on demand. We would not be talking about the rights of reproduction if we were really thinking to ourselves from the book of God, from his word, Psalms 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Every human being. This is not just David, the man after God's own heart, or David the king. No, this is people. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, he describes the womb. He has no other way to describe it. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All my days were written for me, ordained for me, rather written in your work, in your book, rather, before one of them came to be. God has a plan for you. You're saying since you came out of your mother, 
life has been worthless. You've been beaten. You've been uh, belittled. You've been mistreated. God has a plan for you in all of our days. All of yours, all of mine were written in his book before we ever exited our mother's womb. You, I, we matter to God. And so do those precious unborn children. Body of Christ, someday we'll stand before a holy God and he, he'll say, why, why? Every one of us will have to give our own individual account. But my prayer is that regardless of what's taken place in the past in your life, you can look at these verses and say, you know what? God's word doesn't lie. God's word is truth. And God's word says he values human life. He values me. He values us. And he values those who have yet to be born. David said it like this. You knew me when I was still being knit and formed together in my mother's womb. When no one else could see me, you knew me. I've always wondered what would happen if someone came up with what they call a public service announcement and it showed the birth of a baby and then the baby was immediately locked in a dark place and fed and given a dry diaper or something like that. But the announcer said, we have a service now that allows you to decide whether or not you wish to keep the child. In Texas, praise God, they're saying if we can hear a heartbeat, that, that's a vital, that's a living human being. And I praise God for other states that are falling in that same line. Body of Christ, that unborn child matters to God. That living person who's gone through an awful life matters to God. We matter to God. And so do the lives of all the people on this planet. What we do with that information should say, should drive, should dictate, if you will, in our lives, how we live our lives. I pray that you know that God loves you, that you're valuable to Him, that no matter what has happened in your life, no matter what you've done, God loves you. He sent His Son Jesus to die for you if no one else had ever lived. Jesus would have come and died for me, for you. I pray that you know that you're valuable to him. As always, you may write to us at The Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and our zip code is 76301. If we can pray for you, it would be our honor to do so. If you want to let us know that you're praying for us, we'd be encouraged to hear that as well. That address again is The Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and our zip code is 76301. You're saying people today don't write letters. Yes, they do. And we'd love to get one from you, letting us know how we can pray for you or for someone for whom you care or letting us know that you're praying for us. We'll see you again next week here on The Word of Truth. You've been watching The Word of Truth from First Baptist Church, Wichita Falls. Join us again next week for The Word of Truth. 